We hope you are enjoying the third and final season of Picard and continue to join us every week as we explore each episode and go through all the details you may have missed. And please stay tuned to the end to get a special inside look at this episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself, so you don't want to miss this episode. Last week's episode ended as we learned Beverly has a son and they are being hunted. The show ends with the intimidating Shrike engulfing the Elios ominously. This episode begins two weeks before the events of the last episode, and we see Beverly's son Jack Crusher has brought the Elios to Sarnia Prime, which is in a quarantine zone. Fenris Rangers appear and force him to submit to an inspection. We learn that they are trying to deliver medical supplies to people in need. But to get through the political red tape, he's bribing inspectors with Romulan ale and weapons. Not a bribe. What Jack doesn't know is these Fenris Rangers were looking for him and report his location to someone unknown. Later we learn this is only the beginning of a series of unexpected visitors hunting them. Pew, pew, pew. It's bad guys shooting bad guys. Back to present day, we are once again looking at the menacing Shrike facing off with the Elios, and we get bad guy music that is a throwback to the original series episodes. Jack tells Picard and Riker that the Elios has been close to the nebula for too long and it's fried their systems. Picard wants to negotiate, but the Shrike doesn't seem to be there to negotiate. Beverly is in need of medical attention and they want to get her back to the Titan, but the Titan is out of range. Back on the Titan, the bridge has registered the Shrike on their sensors and realize it is dangerous. Seven starts prepping to go in and save Picard, but Shaw says to belay that order, reminds Seven of her place, then points out that the Titan is an exploratory vessel and that they are outgunned and he doesn't want to risk the lives of 500 crew members. Back on the Elios, Jack is desperately trying to get his mother prepared for the shuttle, and we get our first interaction between Picard and Riker about Beverly's son. Riker tells Picard there is something very familiar about him, and Picard looks uncertain to say the least. The Shrike disables its prey and destroys the shuttle. With Beverly's life support failing, they seem to be doomed. We get an external shot from the debris of the explosion, and we see a piece of hull fly at the screen with the name of the shuttlecraft, the Savik. Star Trek Picard Season 3 has many overtures to the original series movies, and of course, we remember Savick as the Vulcan Starfleet cadet mentored by Spock who underwent the Kobayashi Maru at the beginning of the Wrath of Khan movie. Originally played by Kirstie Alley, who would go on to be a star in Cheers, and who passed away just a couple of months ago, Savick would go on to be played by Robin Curtis during the Search for Spock and Voyage Home movies. The scene ends with that wonderful blaster beam sound we remember from the V'ger flyover in Star Trek The Motion Picture. The sound was created by child star turned musician Craig Huxley, who ironically played Kirk's nephew in the original series. Back to Rafi, we find her berating herself for not being able to stop the people that stole the secret weapon from Daystrom before they could use it. We find out 117 lives were taken in the attack. Rafi's handler tells her the investigation is over, as they now believe a Romulan named Larock Toluco was responsible for the attack. But Rafi isn't convinced, and becomes angry as she decides she will talk to an underworld drug boss Ferengi named Sneed to uncover the truth. Her handler tells her to stand down, but Rafi refuses. Back on the Titan, Seven goes to Captain Shaw and reports that Picard is under attack. Shaw, still angry that she helped them take the shuttle, won't help. But Seven leaves him with a sober thought. Sir, you could be the hero, or you could be remembered for being the captain who let two legends die. Over on the Elios, Picard is already one step ahead as he starts placing transport inhibitors on the walls, and just in time as the Shrike tries to beam Jack off the ship. As a tractor beam locks onto the Elios, Beverly's life support is draining and all seems lost. In what is the first of many moments to come this season that will make you stand up, punch the air, and scream yes, the Titan screams in from off screen and blocks the tractor beam with the hull of the ship. It's an incredibly exciting moment that you just don't see coming. Shaw, against everything he believes, has come to save the day, thanks to Seven's speech. And it's important to note here, in what would have been a thoughtless plot mistake in Picard seasons 1 and 2, the Titan can't beam everyone off the Helios, but Jack remembers that the transport inhibitors are still on. It is small moments like this all over this season that remind us the writers have left no detail forgotten. With everyone safe, for now, back on the Titan, we get back to Rafi, who has returned to Metalis Prime to meet with her ex-husband Jay, who is now an artist but still has connections to the crime underworld. We get an update from Season 1 of Rafi's relationship with her son and granddaughter, 
Disappointed that Rafi has prioritized conspiracies over her son, Jay tells her he will help her connect with her child or the underworld Ferengi boss, but not both. Rafi reluctantly chooses the conspiracy, and it's not hard to imagine she realizes this will have future ramifications on her. Back on the Titan, the Shrike circles the smaller Starfleet vessel like a shark sizing up its wounded meal in the ocean. We meet Vatic for the first time. She knows who Captain Shaw is and hints that she's surprised he remains functional considering his Starfleet psychological profile. Picard takes charge of the situation, State your business. reminiscent to the last time we saw him in TNG. Vatic reveals that she wants Jack Crusher, that there is a bounty on his head and she will have him. In a moment that makes it clear she has no fear of the Titan, she makes the Shrike vulnerable by lowering her shields so they can see what she plans on destroying them with, including an unknown technology in the primary position. What could that be? Vatic gives them an hour to hand Jack over to her and demonstrates her power by using her tractor beam to throw, that's right, I said throw, the Elios at the Titan. Shields up! Evasive maneuvers! There's a first in Star Trek storytelling, and we say, give us more. The Elios leaves a scar as it breaks up along the hull of the Titan. We find out that everything Vatic said about Jack is true. He is a wanted criminal as a result of his acts of operating on the edge of Federation space. Shaw wants to turn Crusher over to protect his crew, but Riker and Picard talk him into using their time to learn as much as they can. Riker finally confronts Picard about Jack and asks him, are you not seeing what I'm seeing? Picard tells Riker not to speculate, but you can see this is weighing heavily on Jean-Luc. A visit to the brig allows Jack a chance to explain his actions to Picard and surprises him by saying Beverly was right there with him doing these things the whole time. Picard accuses him of lying, and this leads to an escalating argument that ends with Picard asking who his father is and Jack saying, I never met my father. The uncomfortable silence that follows is played excellently by both actors and leaves us thinking, whoa. Jack then says he wants to give himself up to give his mother a future, but Picard won't turn him over without his day in court. Back with Rafi on Metallus Prime, she arrives in Sneed's drug lair. If you thought the Ferengi we met here seems familiar, you would be right. He is none other than 12 Monkeys' James Cole himself. Metallus pulled in more than Todd Stashwick from his successful 12 Monkeys time travel show. Aaron Stanford stands in as a very believable and treacherous Ferengi. As Rafi tries to pry information from the underworld boss, he forces her to use drugs to prove she's not Starfleet. Rafi reluctantly complies, but Sneed is still one step ahead of her. The 12 Monkeys Picard Season 3 team had a little fun here by naming the drug she takes Splinter as a riff on the effect that happens to time travelers over multiple time travel trips in the 12 Monkeys universe. Hearing Stanford deliver the line was a delicious thrill for fans of both universes. Sneed reveals her lies by showing her the head of the Romulan she claimed to work for, and all hell breaks loose as Rafi stabs Sneed in the hand, and then a cur left comes through the chest of one of his henchmen. Another standing ovation moment happens as Worf, son of Moog, tears through the bad guys like a hot knife through butter and beheads Sneed. Klingon music plays as he helps a drugged out Rafi and utters his first lines. I told you, do not engage. That's right, Worf is her handler. Yes, we heard some of you guessing after episode one, after the handler told Rafi she was a warrior. There is no better way Worf could have been introduced to the series except in battle. Back on the Titan, time is running out for Jack. Picard and Riker try to convince Shaw to change his mind. He's not even convinced he's Beverly Crusher's son and with her still unconscious, there is really no way to prove it. Jack manages to escape from the brig in a clever Starfleet tech way, while at the same time Riker is giving Beverly a hypospray against the wishes of her doctor. Vatic comes on long enough to taunt Picard and Shaw, giving them the meaning of her ship's name and threatening to peck away at them little by little until there's nothing left. It nearly works as Shaw is about to turn him over but discovers Jack has escaped. Seven finds him and we learn he's trying to transport himself off the ship and turn himself over to Vatic. Shaw, still unconvinced, is about to hand him over when Will escorts Beverly onto the bridge. She looks at Picard, he looks at her, and suddenly we all know. Picard takes command and orders the boy to stay on board. Boy stays here. And then he tells Shaw why. Because he's my son. This is finally enough to get Shaw to come along, showing us the captain has more feelings about him than we realize. The Titan launches everything she's got at the Shrike as Vatic laughs at the measly attack and follows them into the nebula. The episode ends with Vatic's menacing laugh. <laughs>
This reveal of Picard's son is sure to keep Star Trek fans talking all week, if not weeks on end. And we may be talking about that moment between Jean-Luc and Beverly for years to come. It was a poignant and historical moment in the Star Trek universe. More details of Jack and his relationship with his father will be revealed in future episodes. That and many more questions will still unfold. What is the story behind Shaw's psychological profile? What is Worf doing working for Starfleet Intelligence? When exactly did Beverly and Jean-Luc have a son? And when will we see the other members of our TNG crew? All will be revealed as the showrunner and his team leave no stone unturned and every plot point earned. Are you feeling that Star Trek loving feeling? If so, give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as we'll be doing this every week. And don't forget to pay close attention to the end credits, which is played beautifully over Jerry Goldsmith's first Contact theme song, as there are some wonderful nuggets there that might clue you in on the show moving forward. And stay tuned because in a moment we are going to share with you thoughts on episode 2 directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis. But first, what do you think? Did this episode of Star Trek Picard Season 3 lock you in for the rest of the season? Or do you need to see more. Tell us what you think and let's talk about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to hear more discussions about this topic and others just like it, please join us over at our other channel, The Podcast Unleashed, where we'll be conducting interviews with your favorite Star Trek personalities. Also, please consider supporting the channel and get your own Captain Shaw-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at MixTees.com. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. And now, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner Terry Metalis. So the idea for Worf this season, when we talked to Michael and, we were, and when we were breaking it, was that he, he was a little bit more of a samurai, that he was out there chasing down leads uh, from the Dominion War. Um, and that uh, even though some of the canon books had him as captains of starship, we didn't want to negate and say that those things didn't happen. We're just saying that's not where he was now. Well, as an archetype, it, we knew we wanted a classic Star Trek larger-than-life villain. Um, and um, without going into spoiler details as to who and what she is. Um, we knew that she would have some deep-rooted uh, feelings towards the Federation, and Starfleet in particular, and uh, there, there was an erratic sensibility we wanted to give her. And uh, Amanda Plummer was, I think, the first and almost only name that was ever brought up in that writer's room. Why? Uh, I'm just curious. I've just always been a fan of Amanda Plummer. I love Amanda Plummer. Um, uh, and uh, and there's also the Star Trek DNA in, in there as well. Um, but that wasn't uh, at all a deciding factor or, 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 or a really strong contributing factor at all. It was mostly about Amanda. Mm. Um, Amanda has the ability to show... Um, <clears throat> Certainly that erratic sensibility, but also great sensitivity and um, unpredictability uh, that we thought was right for the character. What would they say? You know, there, there's the... Is it my son? Yes, it is, Jean. Like, there's... It, it's, it's so much more powerful than these, act, that these actors can just pull that off. Um... I, I think the looks, the score, the moment itself says everything. Um, that you don't, you don't need it. Um, and if you built the episode right, uh, I felt like it could work. I was worried it couldn't. <laughs> I was worried it wouldn't, for sure. Because he's my son. <laughs> <laughs>